beautiful people. I'm Danny. And I'm Britt, and this is the Gay Cousin Club Podcast. All right. You want to call the meeting to order right away? Well, you just did. So, bang, bang, bang. I am out of it. I'm sorry. Normally, I normally I am like set up and ready and waiting for you. And this time I got distracted and did not understand how long you were actually saying. So now I'm like, I'm rushed and my yeah, brain is 20 dumb. minutes ago. You were like, I'm ready whenever. And I was like, all right, I'm going to put my kids to bed in a minute. And then I literally went and put my kids to bed in a minute. And my office is right next door to their bedrooms. And then you were like, wait, you're ready? Like, what? I, I literally I gave you a frame of time. I gave you a unit of measurement. You did. You. I was going to say in my defense, but no, you did. So, my bad. Anyway, tell me about your life. How are you doing? I don't know. I'm good. My life's not bad. I don't know. You always, like, I have some story. I never have stories. I just I go to work. I come home and I play with my kids. And I fall asleep on the couch. That's my whole life. It's not oh, very interesting. I do that, too. Um. So, well, okay. I guess I do have a story. You always do. Okay, on Easter, um, our friends who live in Portland came to visit, and um, that was super cool. Hey, Kayla and Candace, if you're listening. Um, and we were drinking wine and stuff, because I'm like, this is delightful. But I forgot that I'm not 21, and... You, we you say so that like it's wine. a novel experience. That's you literally every time you no, drink. No, no. Not every time I drink. Don't make it sound like I have a problem. But No, I mean like every time no. you, not <laughs> like when you have like a beer after work or while we're recording, but I'm saying like when you like go out or get together with friends, you're, that's like, that's every time. Uh, I guess. But I mean, the problem though was that Easter is on a Sunday. So Monday, I'm like, I'm fucking dying, and like, I don't want to go to work hungover. Like, this is embarrassing. But at least, like, I sit not by people. So by the time like I could get it together, then people saw me. And by get it together, I mean just look less tired. I just looked exhausted because mm-hmm. I was, and had an angry tummy. But you know, that's what you get when you drink a lot of wine and. You forget who you are as a person. Yeah. Yeah. You forgot. You went you went and forgot. Yeah. And also, um, you said you you know, when you realized you're not twenty one, when you were twenty one, you were also terrible at drinking. <laughs> like Oh my god. Danny, yeah. Danny, okay. So Go ahead. I don't know. I don't know if our, our be friend, honest. if our friends slash former roommates actually listen to this, but if they do, shout it to them and me. Because we lived with you and we had to put up with you every fucking Sunday being like, I'm not hungover, guys. I just had the flu that happens. People get like a 24-hour flu bug. And we're like, yeah, Danny, but not like every fucking weekend. <laughs> and like the worst the worst thing was, it's not like I was just saying it. Like I didn't want to admit I was hungover. Like I 100% you, gaslit myself into Yeah, you meeting. gaslit yourself 10,000%. And we were always like, yeah. I, know, I know you believe that you have the flu. But you don't have the flu, okay? And, I mean, or, looking so, back like, on it, I'm like, damn, you, dummy. <laughs> you would, like, lay in bed and be like, I just had the flu. And you'd be all bitchy. And we'd have to, like, come out in the kitchen. And we'd be, like, making coffee and stuff. And be like, so, and somebody would be like, so does Danny have the flu again? <laughs> yeah, it's crazy how, like, the flu would go away after I ate some greasy food or some ramen and some coffee. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you'd be just ready for your end to go. Okay, so... Well, we're laughing. I, my sister, or my sister-in-law, but my, my sister. I was like, me? What? No, not you. <laughs> One of my other ones. Um, She was FaceTiming us this weekend because she lives overseas. And she was saying that, you know, like, she'll be biking around because you're the Europe of it all. They're so much cooler than us. Um, Anyway, they'll be, she'll be biking around and like listening to the podcast. And when I laugh, she was like, well, when Britt laughs, it's fine because she just snorts, which is oh, no. accurate. And she's like, but when Danny laughs, sometimes I have to be like, oh, because <laughs> like you have such an explosive laugh that it'll like blast into her ears while she's got her headphones in when she's biking. And it's like such a shock oh. to her system. Uh, I thought that was really funny. The worst thing is like I try to seek out my laughs and I lower the volume. I know. I usually lean. 
I've gotten in the habit of like I lean back when I start laughing because my snorts are so aggressive. So I promise you, um, Danny's not the only aggressive laugher. Mine are just snortlier and I back away from the mic. <laughs> snortlier. I like it. Yeah. Um, I This is unrelated, but have you had – you're going to make fun of me because of what I'm drinking. So just I'm ready for it. I will pause. Of course. I, it's sour or cider and you're going to call it a beer. It's not. So I'm thin. such a hater today. What's going you on? You are. Um, it is a white claw, which is why you're going to make fun of me. Oh, no. There that's fine. Oh, okay. There ain't you, you no laws when you're having the claws. Um, I will judge you for saying that. Don't say that. <laughs> yeah, that's reasonable. But it's one of their new ones, the vodka soda plus real juice. Have you had those? No, I don't. I'm not I know really you a don't really, person. Like, yeah. I'll drink it in a pinch, but I'm a tequila. If I'm going to have liquor, it's going to be tequila. So I'm pretty sure White Claw makes tequila ones. But um, no, mm. Kayla and Candace left this at my house, and it is a peach one, and it was like really strong smelling. And I'm like, oh, this is going to taste like syrup. It is pleasant. Like, this is That's a nice good. summer afternoon beverage. Or and it feels like a summer afternoon today. It's so nice out. Oh my gosh. Also, while while you're sipping that and I'm sipping on my haterade, can I tell you why I'm actually being a hater? Because I thought like freaking... you were actually calling your beverage haterade. And I was like, well, no, what I'm beverage are you having? Pink wine. No, I look I look out my freaking balcony door next to my desk and it usually makes me so happy because I just see my street and people are out walking. And I saw a little toddler girl trying to walk a dog. It was comically ridiculous because of course you can't walk a dog. But and then I peek over and I see that same goddamn camper trailer that i told you about over the weekend guys somebody put a camper trailer in front of my house and like there's a padlock on it and stuff and they wrote in sharpie on the door do not open this door if you do you will be on camera and the cops will be called and they parked it out in front of our house and then they moved in around the block from us but they left it parked in front of our house and now it looks like we have this weird like and it looks and the windows are like all blocked with tinfoil and there's like abandoned vehicle stickers all over it and i'm not trying to be like like no, I'm not trying to be a bitch, but it looks kind of massively heavy. It also looks kind of like conspiracy theorist lives in a campery, and that's all in front of our house. And like people be like, that's so embarrassing. Like I was out on our porch, like putting out chairs because it's nice out, and these people are like walking by and they like read it, like they read what's on the door, and then they like look up at me, and then they like keep walking and like kind of giving me the side eye. And I'm like, I'm not crazy. I just I moved to this neighborhood because I wanted to make friends. <laughs> you know, nobody's gonna be my friend because of the creepy trailer. Okay, not that I think you sound like a Karen, but so that you don't sound like a Karen, can you? I do feel like I feel just like wait, a Karen. Can you explain what you were doing? when you realized like oh, that they yeah, were yeah. when, it when was I adorably sweet okay so it's parked out in front of our house my husband was 100 percent being a karen love you pal but he knows it he's being a karen about it but so like we didn't know that there was anybody in it like we just saw it get dropped off and then it was like padlocked shut and that was the end of it and we're like oh that's weird because they like put it up on jacks and it's just like it's just there and it has all these like abandoned vehicle stickers on it from other towns. And we were like, mm, shit. So he did call it into a non-emergency line because he was just like, I don't know if this is abandoned here. He's like, I'm not looking, you know, basically I'm not looking to get anybody in trouble. But like, what do we do? And they're like, oh, I kind of just waited out for 48 hours and see what happens, I guess. And we're like, okay, that's fine. And well, I said, okay, that's fine. He was not fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the next morning, I look out the window and all of a sudden there's like a little kid coming out of there. And I'm like, oh, my God were like people sleeping in there overnight and it had gotten cold overnight we're in the midwest like it's nice during the day but it gets cold at night and i was like oh my gosh are there people living in there with like no heat so then i felt like a real asshole so it was like easter morning so i'm like running around or i was like um working out but cause i could see through the that same balcony door or whatever is where i was working out when i saw this all happening so then i was gonna go put together like a basket or something like you know, we had Kringle sales at the kids' school. So I was going to get a Kringle and like a bottle of juice and just like, I was just going to bring some food over. And then all of a sudden. Make sure they're okay. Have some food for the little kid. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden in a window on the other side of the house, as I was like going down the stairs, I see like they're going into the house. Like it's like around the block from us, but next door. And I was like, oh, what's going on? And then throughout the week, they've just been taking stuff out of the camper or throughout like the first couple of days of the week, they're taking stuff out of the camper and moving it into the house. And now it's like just sitting there. And they asked my husband, like, if he knows anybody who wants it. And he was like, no, but are you going to move it? <laughs> like, it's just really And awkward. not when you've written on the door in fucking Sharpie. Like, you're creepy meth lab. Yeah. yeah. And now they're like, 
living next door so like i don't want to be rude like their ball came under our fence for their kids so i went outside now and, and they kind of like wait for me to the window so i was like oh hey how's it going and i passed the ball over and like could i have said something about it yes am i gonna confront anybody i absolutely 100 not so instead i was like let's be friends also like it's not like you would say <laughs> so that the, the kid like hey have your parents move their fucking well, it was camera the, it was the mom oh okay okay it okay. was the mom i was like on the phone and she was like waving me down through the window and like called me outside and i was like hey what's up and she's like oh give me more balls and i was like oh yeah sure so it would have been like a really good opportunity to be like oh hey you look beautiful in the camper you just moved in um move it <laughs> no, yeah i don't know and the thing is they have like a, a way bigger driveway than we do like, yeah like a parking lot style driveway like they could definitely move it to their property oh, i'm being a karen it, it, it's whatever it's fine i'm gonna split it i promise i'm not only a karen it's just i feel like you, you just like i wake up every morning and i look outside and i'm like oh, okay, that so part weird. sounding karen-y but otherwise the rest of it i'm like i feel like it's more just this is really awkward and weird where I don't know. Yeah, it's a really awkward. Maybe situation. it's my also you, white if lady. If I was waking up every morning and I don't realize that I'm also a yeah, Karen. That's true. Like, yeah, if it, I think if I was waking up every morning to see a camper, I would be like, whatever. Like, use the street. I don't give a fuck. I don't own the street. But it's the fact that it's like the weird writing on it, and people keep looking up at me like, "Bitch, what? You're weird. Like, put that in your driveway." And I'm like, "It's not mine." But okay, fantastic. So I'm gonna tell you about my story Please now. Do because we got really off topic, and I just sound like annoying white Karen. And that's okay. Okay. Recently, how I came across the story, like normally when I, back when I was teaching, um, this time of year, I was always teaching the memoir Night by Elie Wiesel, yeah. um, which is a Holocaust survival memoir. So um, he was a young teenage boy. Yeah. It's really harrowing. It's like 95 pages of some of the most beautiful writing, but horrible, horrible things I've ever read. My soul and every single year I had to teach it because yeah. just because it's so heavy, it hurt. Yeah. It, but like his writing was so beautiful and I just... This is weird, but I have like this weird kind of like nostalgia just because I had teaching where I taught at that time. It wasn't always like the most open minded people, but reading that book and understanding that it was like a real person's experience helped a lot of students just stop and be like, wow, that's fucked. And then we, some students would bring up like current events that they felt like were similar. And they'd be like, well, how do people still believe stuff like this? You know? And it was just a good experience and I always appreciated it. It was like emotionally taxing and it was like a lot of mental work for me, but I always felt like I came out the other side of it having like we did something good, you know? Yeah. And over the weekend, I wasn't doing anything good. I was just scrolling TikTok and being a Karen apparently. And um, I just happened across this story about Dutch Nazi resistors and it felt like the universe was telling me, like, girl, no. you're supposed to be teaching about this. And I was like, you know what? You're right. It is that time of year I'm supposed to be teaching about this. Because, well, the reason it was always in April. Wait. Well, like, it always fell in April, which was always, like, really interesting for my students because we would be ending the memoir right around the same time that Elie Wiesel was liberated from the camps. So mm -hmm. it was, like, om almost on the anniversary. And we're kind of around that time right now. So I just feel like it's the right time to tell are, the story. Are you doing... Because... Oh, you know you story. Are. Don't no, ruin it. Don't no, ruin it. No, 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 no. Because, okay, I'm going to say two names. And if you are doing mm. either or both of those, I'm going to piss my pants because literally you told me, like, the next one I might have to do because you're getting really busy. So I was just looking up some ideas. And I, like, literally have tabs open on my computer for me to read at lunch tomorrow that I didn't start yet. But I was like, oh, this would be really Oh, So, so you don't. I did it. Frida Belenfante. Yeah. Frida Belenfante Willa? and Villa Marandeus. Yeah. Oh my God. Oh my I'm gosh. so excited. Oh That's some God. really wild synchronicity because yeah. I saw like a TikTok that had like very few likes. It just kind of came up on my weird algorithm. And that's very, some. that's some really weird synchronicity. I had his name written down from like a week ago when I started looking up some names um, and then like went um, to possibly look up and so i did just like a little tiny baby google search of him and her name came up too and i was like oh this would be really cool because it would be a twofer and i was like mm, but i probably won't go like in depth enough so like maybe i should suggest oh, this to britney no you're such a good storyteller i'm excited for yeah so just so you guys heads up for you guys um i'm heading into like a very i've been in a very busy season at work right now um and next week it's gonna get really fucking wild so i'm just gonna have zero bandwidth left like today Danny when Danny texted me i was out cold on the couch because i'm so exhausted so she's gonna be working on researching our next story and i know she will do wonderfully because she did really great last time but oh you know what another weird synchronicity i mentioned 
my sister this early at the beginning of the episode yeah. who lives overseas and now we're talking about dutch resistors and she's living in the netherlands i just feel like oh, that's right i thought it was really cool too because i'm like i know that she listens yeah. frequently so that would yeah. be really cool to do this is, i'm well so and while excited. we're at it shout out to my other shout out to my other sister my husband's other sister you're awesome too you just you also live in like basically the same town as me so i didn't have a story for that <laughs> but have you in law in laws yes great let's get into it this is so cool i'm so excited so, now uh, yeah i hope you didn't read too much about it yeah. but so frida belinfante was born in amsterdam on may 10th 1904 uh she was one of four siblings although she'd find out later in life that she actually had a half brother i didn't dig too far into that kind of stuff because i wanted to stick more to the resistance and what they did for the world so i have a little bit of background information on our our subjects today but for the most part i'm going to get into like what they did cool, cool, cool. um so some of frida's background then her father was jewish and her mother was a gentile um, and she actually recur- recalled being encouraged by her father to explore whatever li- religion he wanted. She wanted, and he said, um, "There was no church in our life designated to be ours." So, I love like, that. Open-minded. Yeah, I think that's a really cool way to look at it because I'm not religious, but like if that's something my kids want to pursue, I need to check some of my religious bias and like experiences that I've had because theirs could be much better. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a good way of looking at it. So Frida was also born into a really musical family. Her father, Aaron, was a pianist and a teacher in Amsterdam who was the first um, pianist to present the entire cycle of Beethoven piano sonatas during a single season at the Amsterdam concert. And then the rest of that is very Dutch, so I don't know how to say it. But that, sounds really <laughs> was, cool. big, that was a big deal, so that's cool. Yeah, the apple definitely did not fall far from the tree. Uh, Frida was receiving training as a cellist by age 10. And although her parents divorced around this time and, you know, she like split her time between mom and dad's houses, um, she still maintained her cello lessons because it was really important to her. And she actually went on to graduate from the Amsterdam Conservatory and made her debut accompanied by her dad on the piano, which is so Aww. cool, at the age of 17. That is heartwarming and really impressive. Yeah, for a woman, too. Yeah, at that time. yeah. And like I said, I'm not going to go too far into her life. I want to focus more on the group as a whole. But I think this is just important to see here that the arts were so near and dear to Frida. And that's not something that she was ever going to be willing to give up. And we'll see that like as all hell breaks loose. So um, I, I want to um, cut in really quick. I, I realized. Yeah, go for it. I realized this afternoon when I was like looking into it that I had listened to a podcast episode about her. Um, mm. But but it was like only a half hour podcast. And like it was more of like dipping the toe in the water where like I find her fascinating but i realized that this was like a year or two ago so i feel like parts of this i'm gonna be like oh yeah, i totally remember that but so much of it especially if you're focusing on the group aspect i'm like i have no idea and i'm stoked okay good i'm glad i mean either way it's an awesome story to tell and i'm just so in awe of what they did but i'm glad that it's still gonna have some surprise yeah. for you so you know, like I said, um, she was going to keep pushing to be involved in the arts, even as a woman, um, so much so that in 1938, she actually conducted her first orchestra, totally defying the norms, and became one of Europe's first female conductors of a professional orchestra. So fucking cool. So, yeah, we can already see that when, like, Frida wants to do something, it's going to take a hell of a lot to stop her. And she even said once when she was told that something wasn't possible, that her response was always, well, we'll see about that. And Sounds I love just that. like our <laughs> other Frida we did. Different spelling, but... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that includes also just like living her truth, like who she was. Mm-hmm. Frida was a lesbian. And although she was even married to a man for a short time at one point, she was never going to hide or deny that part of herself. And she told her husband flat out who she really so was. Awesome. And her, her first true love was a woman named Henrietta, a pianist and a composer. So you can Aww. imagine what they probably you know hit it off over. Um, and they went on to live together for seven years. After that relationship, Frida, you know, she had been with other women, but with all of them, she was not concerned about people knowing. She said, I just lived my life and didn't explain anything to anyone. People found out when they found out. So fucking like, cool. That is really, admirable. Yeah. yeah. At that time, holy cow. And, and, you know, around this time, Frida had bigger issues to be concerned with. You know, the Nazis are rising in power. Frida began to fear for the safety of her friends and loved ones. Remember, she's half Jewish, so this didn't necessarily make her a direct target for the Nazis, but it did certainly affect a lot of people that she cared about. Frida also had to be concerned about the Nazis' notorious paragraph 175, like that part of their criminal code that named homosexuality yeah. as a crime mm-hmm. specifically though it did name homosexuality amongst men as we saw in many laws yeah. in many of our stories um because the nazis described this as basically like a choice that men made to go against what 
the Nazis considered the laws of nature. Men specifically were targeted because they're the ones who actually had the ability to rise in the ranks and be rulers in the oh, okay. eyes. And they didn't want que- queer men to have that kind of power. Okay, so it was more like they just don't give a shit about women. Uh, like I, homosexuality is still it, bad, but, I, but like men we have to focus on because men can be strong leaders and like build the motherland and blah, 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 right? But like women are just Yeah, like, but I mean the stuff they did, it, well, no, and it's okay. more than that though. We'll talk more about it later about like how far they took it they definitely had feelings about homosexuality specifically oh yeah 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 so so although frida wasn't necessarily directly targeted this did mean that you know a a man that was soon to be a dear friend of hers would be put like right in the nazis direct sights yeah um and that brings us to a little bit of background on that notorious man named willem arandeus he was born in 1894 so he's a little bit older than um frida he was born to a non-jewish family he was one of six kids he grew up in amsterdam like Frida, his family was also deeply embedded in the arts, and his parents were both costume designers. Unlike Frida, though, it seems like there wasn't as much open-mindedness. Um, his relationship with his parents was really, really rocky. And at the age of 17, he left home due to his family's inability to accept his homosexuality, and he severed all contact with them. Wow. So during this time, Willem turned to the arts and began both writing and painting. Um, he was super talented, but he was definitely living that like struggling artist life. Um, eventually he was commissioned to do a mural for the Rotterdam town hall, which was pretty huge. Um, and then when he was 38, he met a man named Jan Tyson and just like Henrietta and Frida, they went on to live together for seven years. So yeah, Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So during this time, like I said, Willem was living this like kind of starving artist life. He was definitely struggling like financially a lot, um, but he knew it's the life he wanted, so he kept pushing. He found small jobs, designing posters, illustrating poetry, that kind of stuff. Um, where his success came, though, was he eventually went on to write the biography of a gay Dutch painter named Matthijs Maris. And I'm super sorry if I pronounced that wrong. I looked up a pronunciation. <laughs> Pronounce names. <laughs> um, and after the the book was published, like I said, his financial situation is improving. It's a relief because he went pretty unrecognized for about a decade. Um, so do you think it's that like his his work wasn't like quote unquote good enough or was it more just like that it wasn't like the style of the time i don't know i think it could be a combination of a number of things it could be that he was openly gay oh yeah um it could be that it's just that's just the life of an artist like it's really hard to get exposure to get people to notice you take you seriously to make money it's not like it's just so just plug away into an algorithm lol um and like there you go you you have it it's like it's hit and miss okay yeah so that um the subject of that biography that he wrote was also a political adv- activist so this is where something that Willem might have kind of become inspired to start speaking out against the rising nazi regime when he saw that he was another gay man who spoke out yeah you know? so he was shocked and disgusted by what he saw happening to the community on top of the pain that he already felt about the laws that existed prior to Nazi invasion against queer people like him, he saw it becoming a problem before people realized this is truly a problem. You know, like before the Dutch had to surrender, like he was like, this is not okay. Like he was ready to he do something. He saw the writing on the wall right away. For sure. But then specifically when we talk about what could happen to the queer community. um, So through my research, it seems like for the most part, the Netherlands are seen as kind of like the origin of queer rights, which is super cool. But it, I think it's important to note that that there was some gray area there. So Amsterdam did oh, okay. decriminalize homosexuality in 1811, but restrictive rules still barred homosexuality in the early 20th century. So it's like this weird in between area. So like, what does that de- even mean? So it's decriminalized in 1811, but like even by 1911, 100 years later, the beliefs of the ruling political parties led to the age of consent for homosexuality to be changed to 21. Okay. So despite the, the, you know, at that time, the age of consent for heterosexuality was 16. Not that I'm saying it should be 16. But, yeah, yeah. Um, But basically around that time, the first gay bar is opening, but the restrictive age rules and, you know, other laws against so-called public indecency okay. meant that gay men were still being targeted. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, having these like loophole, unwritten yeah, subtext yeah. kind of things. Right. And so, I mean, this is, and this is well before the Nazis arrived, but of course that made it much, much worse. Mm-hmm. So 
this actually even affected his ability to find stable housing. Um, like Frida, he refused to hide his identity. He was openly gay. Um, and he would get kicked out of apartments. Landlords would learn that he's gay and he'd be out on the street oh trying goodness. to find places to live. So between like his initial lack of success, he's got this strained family situation, he's po- poverty and then lack of s- secure housing. All of this equated to a man who felt just fucking beaten down, super defeated. And, you know, this is all like according to his diaries, it seems to have changed when he joined the resistance against the Nazis. He decided like, no, fuck that. Like I'm taking charge. It, okay, like, so that is so admirable, though, like that he he's already going the starving artist route, right? Where like mm-hmm. jobs or food security has to be low. Money security is obviously low because of this. But then that he is not willing to compromise on who he is and like hide who he is, even though like technically at this point, like it would be safer for him if he did yeah, and he was oh, just 100%. like no i don't care and like that it happened multiple times that it's just like nope you're out on the street nope you're out on the street mm-hmm. and he's like fine but this is who i am that is such unbelievable strength yeah and it's not just strength for himself because at this time his main focus was actually protecting his jewish neighbors remember he was not jewish so he saw this impending threat from the nazis coming yeah and he was also of course well aware of what could happen to the lgbtq community Mm -hmm. what was already happening um which kind of give you some numbers there in germany at least um not speaking to the netherlands necessarily but in germany over fifty thousand gay men had been imprisoned by the nazis so there was a real and imminent danger for his community you know and of course it's hard to know for sure but it's estimated today that between five thousand to fifteen thousand gay men were sent to concentration camps where they were abused murdered and then there were also experiments Mm -hmm. done experiments to see like if you could change them it's like that's torture it's not experiments it's torture yeah so at least there it's yeah. closer to the truth than conversion camps because there it's therapy oh, but at least there they're so like disgusting. no we're experimenting it's torture then, yeah God, that's disgusting oh, so now we're at the part where they come together our team comes together we're building this resistance right so Willem and Frida bonded initially over a love of the arts, um, which was also something that the Nazis got their dirty hands all yeah. over. Um, if artists and writers like lucked out and their work wasn't being completely destroyed or outlawed, they would have had to still register for any like amount of success with the Nazi Chamber of Culture. So as you can imagine, they're obviously going to ne- neglect to include Jews and in representations of like the yeah, definitely, yeah. So. Not long after the Nazi invasion, Frida basically disbanded her orchestra and she told them, like, men, there isn't going to be an orchestra anymore. Like, they're coming for us next. So just chills. You know, you know, she could have been really defeated, but she kind of had that attitude like Willem where she wanted to do something about it. Willem saw his gift as an artist as a tool for revolution, which I think is so badass. He began writing anti-Nazi works. Yeah. And like proliferating these anti-Nazi works, which was obviously illegal. Uh-huh. Um, and as his friendship with Frida grew, they, along with another gr- with a group of people, established a fund to help creatives who couldn't find work under the Nazi regime to financially support these other people. That's like so Willem, amazing. Who didn't have financial support. He helped organize financial support for other starving artists. And I just think that's so cool. That's so fucking cool. Yeah. So shit continues to get worse, as we know, all too well. Stuff's progressing. Frida and Willem are seeing the Jews be brutally persecuted by the nazis and they're ready to fucking do something about it willem's been ready he's like just been waiting for somebody to get on board with him so at this time not only were jewish people being required to wear the yellow star of david to identify themselves their id cards were also stamped with the letter j so basically even if they like can pass as gentile without the star like if they were able to like you know kind of like be undercover um they still have to show their ids like so like to get out in and out of the country they're fucked so, enter our pals Freedom and Willem. They start creating fake IDs. Artists. So this, yeah, exactly. So it kind of seemed like this might have been like Frida's brainchild. Um, she would get non-Jewish friends to give her their IDs, and then she would swap the photo with that of a Jewish person's, and then, of course, like doctor the information. And as like things grew, Willem's artistic abilities definitely helped make these passes like true IDs. Yeah, yeah. So that's not to say... This was like entirely smooth sailing. This was dangerous. Yeah. And in one instance, Frida, she went to visit the homeless and Jewish people who were getting IDs from her because she'd been waiting for them and they didn't show up. Two German soldiers answered the door. 
and they're like raiding the house. So oh like, no! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she bolts. They're suspicious, obviously. So they follow her mm-hmm. back to her home, and she's like, "Shit! Like I have all the shit around here that I make." Yeah. These with. What the fuck? Yeah. So she has to hide the IDs to make sure she doesn't like ruin the whole like game they've got going basically but the guards end up suspicious about the amount of food that she has because they think she's housing jews so she still gets arrested the fuck so there's like yeah yeah so there's like some intense questioning but they never found the ids so basically oh god i love women she basically just decided to be super fucking annoying and told them a bunch of random ass stories and details that they didn't need like didn't have anything to do with anything and eventually they just let her go they were like done talking to her I love I that. Snaps. Snaps for Frida. I fucking love that for her. Use misogyny for your own gains, baby girl. <laughs> they think you're a dumb woman, but you're actually a fucking mastermind. That's on them. Oh That's my gosh. I just made this amazing casserole the other day. And oh, wouldn't you just love to get that off to your wife, don't you know? Yeah, if it took place in the Midwest. <laughs> and they're like, I don't care about your tater tot dish. <laughs> dish. Well, you should. So, it's delightful. <laughs> I actually had tater tots tonight for like the first time in probably like 15 years. They're so wonderful. What? Yeah, because I associate them with like tater tot hot dish or tater tot casserole, which I don't like. I don't like casseroles. So I don't eat them. And we had them tonight for the first time in forever. And I was like, I was like a kid in a fucking candy store. I was eating off my kid's plate. I was just hoovering them all up. <laughs> tater tots are like a cornerstone of my diet. Because <laughs> <laughs> I am a child. I fucking Same. love potatoes. Like the the variety of French That's fried That's... type products that I have in my oh, freezer absolutely. at any given time. It's a cornucopia, if you will. Yes, it's amazing and beautiful and kind of disturbing. True. I will be the cause of the next great potato famine. So anyway, like, so in all, freedom, freedom, Willem and their group created some 70,000 false IDs. 70,000. Which means Whoa. they potentially saved that many lives. Oh my goodness. So, yeah, Villain's artistry super came in clutch. Like they looked really real. But the Nazis start to catch on to these forged documents. Like the numbers aren't numbering, you know? Okay. So they realize there's a pretty straightforward way of finding out what's fake and what's not. Even though like these like these, you know, doctored IDs were pretty Good. pretty impeccable. Yeah. All they had to do was check the documentation against what already existed at the Amsterdam Registry Building. Ah. Right. So the resistance comes to a pretty quick realization, and it kind of seems like this is where Willem took the reins. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Get rid of the fucking registry. Mm-hmm. Get rid of the registry. Yep. So he, at this point, they have a dozen resistance fighters who are ready to just burn this goddamn building to the ground. Ah. But they have to be careful about how often they meet like as they're planning this because they can't raise suspicions right so they divide up their tasks they figure out uh where the information is going to be located in the actual building they get their hands on the elements needed to make bombs explosives and then they start crafting some disguises this is why i love artists Willem recruits a friend another gay man who's a tailor and asks him to make police uniforms oh my goodness yeah. uh. so why might they need police uniforms you ask <laughs> so if they look official, they can go in, knock out an actual security guard, and just blow the bitch up. That's Willem's plan. That's amazing. Yeah. So as this plan is coming to fruition, according to an interview that Frida did later in life, she and Willem had this heart-to-heart recognizing what all of this could really mean. Like, as much as, like, this is very, like, Ocean's Eleven exciting, yeah. um, Willem went to her and he re- asked her, do you think that we will see the end of this war? And she responded, no, I don't think so. And Willem said, I don't think so either. Frida goes on to say, I'd rather give my life for something than give it for nothing. And that was it. That was them basically saying, we'll probably die, but we're going to fucking do this. They have fucking chills. That's amazing. Yeah. That's, yeah. wow. Right? Okay. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. Don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> so the night of Saturday, March 27th, 1943 is drawing near. Villain's leading the charge. He and the other men in the group, no women because the 1940s of it all. Huh. They're going to go in and actually do the dirty work. They're going to burn down this building. So the resistors show up in disguise. They go to the Amsterdam Civil Registry building and tell the security that they need to search for bombs. So they look very official, right? They need to search for bombs. They're in our jackets. Yeah. I love I love so much that they're like just thumbing their noses yeah. at this. It kills me. Like the, the ironic humor where they're like, oh, we got to search for bombs. And they literally are like going to plant the bombs. So security's not stupid. They're not so sure. But there have recently been 
some attacks elsewhere. So they were like, ah, fuck, you know, like, I don't want to be the guy that says, no, you can't go in and the place gets yeah, blown yeah, up. Yeah. So they, they let him go. But our sneaky resistors are jacks of all trades. Not only do we have some tailors in there and artists, we've got two with medical backgrounds and they drugged and knocked out the security no guards. No way. Yes. No. Yes. Meanwhile, Villain leads his part of the crew to the room storing the IDs and they plant their bombs. Then it's just like, wait and see what happens. The bombs go off and 800,000 Dutch IDs are destroyed when this building blows. That's, that sounds like so many. That's so it's and we're talking Jewish and non Jewish. It's yeah. chaos. The Nazis don't know who the fuck is who, and that's the point. That's so that is so fucking smart. Yeah, it's so smart. And the best part, they got away with it. What? They initially got away with it. Wow. But the Nazis then offer a cash reward for anyone who'd talk. So it's within like five oh. days. It's less than a week and someone sells them oh. out. Yeah. Yep. Five days. And of course, who led the charge? Mm-hmm. Willem. So he's arrested and he just takes the blame. Like he says, it's on me. I'm not going to sell it my crew. I'll take it all. And he knows that means he's going to die. He had been, spent his whole life. I did life, everything. Nobody else. Exactly. He spent his whole life being told that as a gay man, he was weak. There was something morally wrong with him, some type of like defect in who he was um, and in other gay men as well like a weakness of character of mentality of their bodies but in this moment he was like nope i'm gonna show you how strong i am and what he did apparently actually inspired other similar events around europe like people start were fighting back well people were fighting back in general of course but like this idea of like bombing the civil registry like that so they couldn't identify jewish people like it helped spark amazing that. that is so fucking cool yeah but of course the nazis aren't going to take him at his word right so they know they do a search. They find that notebook. Um, and they're able to use this to arrest over a dozen other members of his team. Wait, what notebook? Willem's. Remember I said before that he kept like a journal? Oh, yeah. So unfortunately, Willem and depending on what source you read, 11 or 12 other men, it kind of makes me uncomfortable that they don't, the number doesn't seem to be ironed out. But the Willem and around a dozen other men were sentenced to death for their resistance. And as they awaited their sentence to be carried out by firing squad, Willem had, or Willem, excuse me, had one final message that he wanted his lawyer to share with the world. Oh my God, no, I saw this one. I know. His last words were, let it be known, homosexuals are not cowards. Like, okay, just pause. Yeah. Let's sit with that for a minute. (laughs) Well, I literally have full body goosies right now, Mm -hmm. and I knew what you were going to say. Like, I saw that, and like, that is so fucking powerful, especially because you said that, like, his actions, his bravery inspired others to do the same. So, like, how many countless thousands of lives got yeah, saved because of absolutely. his absolutely his yeah. actions and his bravery? Like outside of just Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, the thing with Willem and his crew is so many of them were queer men. So, like, him and some of the other people that were murdered that day were also really brave queer men and they just were not being recognized as such Mm -hmm. so it's just it's pretty heartbreaking yeah but powerful you know that's beautiful so somehow against the odds though with frida still out there right she doesn't get arrested she knew like it can't be long like my days must be numbered until the nazis start hunting me down just like they had Willem, and she had to go into hiding so for the next three months, she disguises herself as a man, and she stayed in the same area. Like, she went all in. Like, not just a fake suit and a fake ID. She cut her hair. And it seems that her disguise was so convincing that she even fooled her family. She later said that she was, like, walking down the street, and she passed by her mom, and her mom didn't recognize her. She just thought it was a man. No oh, way. That is insane. Yeah. yeah. Frida eventually decides, like, the heat's getting too hot, so she's going to leave the Netherlands because she doesn't want basically she has friends helping her like this network of resistors and she doesn't yeah. want that blowback coming on them you know yeah so she's like yeah. i gotta get out of here so it's winter cold as fucking hell and she and some other survivors escape on foot and they cross the alps on foot what? to make it into switzerland cross the alps on foot to make it into switzerland where she would remain in a refugee camp that's wow yeah the strength of these people is wild So, and, like, during her time in the camp, like, going back to the arts, she started giving music lessons to young girls. So, it just seems like you know what's near and dear to her. Mm. It's, like, sticking up for people, and it's music. 
Um, but unfortunately, these kids were fucking assholes. They started talking shit about her being a lesbian. And Frida basically just told them, I don't give free lessons to people like that. So it's finished. You're not going to practice on my cello. Like, Good fuck them kids. for her. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Good for fucking yeah. her. So eventually, you know, after the war, she does head back home. But she chooses to leave um, in 1947 and goes to sunny California. Um, and in California, she does resume her musical career. She forms and conducts the um, Orange County Philharmonic, which is a huge deal. Yeah. Unfortunately, people fucking sucked there, too. Like, they sucked everywhere. Um, and she faced bullshit about being a female composer and a lesbian. She was so over that shit. So, you know, she's dismissed in 1962 because of this. Fuck off. And she moves to New Mexico and teaches music. And then, of course, 15 years later, Orange County acknowledges her contributions and declare a Frida Belenfante day. Like, a little too late, dicks. Yeah. <laughs> you, God, you had a bad bitch. You did. <sighs> and you fucked her over. Mm-hmm. But I love, though, that, like, she's like, I'm not going to stay around where I'm not wanted. Like, go fuck yourself. I'll go make a life elsewhere. Yeah, she's not going to live in the closet to make you comfortable. Yes. Just, like, Willem and mm-hmm, his goddamn exactly. landlords and whatnot. Exactly. Thankfully, though, Frida, unlike Villain, lived a very long life. Um, she would go on to live until the age of 90 when she passed away on April 26, 1995 from cancer. So some of these quotes that I've referenced from Frida. I was were from alive that... at the same time as her. We were, we were alive at the same time as I her. I mean, exactly. briefly, but oh, yeah. that's. Isn't that strange? Like, Fucking this history is not that long ago. It's not that long ago. And I think that's what people forget. Yeah. Yeah, so that I've referenced um, Frida's interview a couple times, like some direct quotes from her. And the reason I have those from her and not from Willem were because um, in 1994, she, so within a year of her death, she relived all of that trauma so that she could share her history and Willem's with the world when she did this um, televised interview. Again, the strength of it. She's like, no, I'm not going to let this story die with me, even though the trauma of having to retell it all. And that's the thing is it could have died with her because up until this point, Willem was all but forgotten. His contributions, the fact that he led this charge that saved so many lives was ignored because he was a gay man and the men he resisted with were gay. It was only in, yeah, 1984, 41 years later, that Willem was posthumously awarded the Resistance Memorial Cross. And in 1986, he was declared a Righteous Among the Nations honor. Um, This was basically, it's given to those during the Holocaust, who were not Jewish, but protected the rights of Jewish citizens in need, which was like so very big honors. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, though, this was given to his estranged family in his memory. Oh. But the public, the public knew nothing about him. You know, so many or so many other LGBTQ people who fought alongside him and sacrificed their lives for the, the cause. And they were just forgotten because of homophobia. So it wasn't until a 1990 TV documentary where Willem and many of the men who died beside him that day were identified as gay. Like, it explicitly said these were queer men. And that's exactly what he would have wanted. He and Frida never wanted to live in the shadows, and they actively pushed back against that throughout their lives. And they pushed back against the idea that they weren't strong because they were queer. Uh, so that's this finally beautiful. Yeah, it finally showed the world what Willem had asked them to, like what he had asked his lawyer to. Homosexuals are not co- cowards. And, you know, Frida spoke of him so highly, of course, throughout her life. But she said... He was a great hero who was most willing to give his life for the cause. Don't want to die for nothing. Just, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So last spring, there was a British TV documentary released that was hosted by Stephen Fry, who's also a gay man. I was trying so hard to watch it. I know, me too. I couldn't get access to it anywhere. Um, but I do want to end with a quote for, of his from that film, so I was able to watch some clips. So here it goes. If the gay painter Willem Arandeas and the lesbian cellist Frida Belenfante seem unlikely heroes of the Dutch resistance, that is only because official histories have taught us so little about the true nature of courage. And that's exactly oh. what Willem would be so proud to know, like that his legacy is now. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And that like yeah. people are not going to forget him and they're not going to forget the true him. That like he went about this. Yep. Because he was gay. Also because he was just a good person and stood up for what he believed in. But, like, yeah. that was why he was on mm-hmm. this, like, outcast side. He's like, I know what this is like. So, no, I'm going to stand up for you. I'm not going to let this happen yes. to people. Exactly. 
How are you hanging in there? I'm turning my camera on. Oh. <laughs> now that we're done recording because it our internet never keeps up with it. My nose is running, but I'm not I'm not are crying. You okay? Like you're, you're doing good. You're doing I good. I did a bit before, <laughs> but you did, yeah, yeah I can tell. <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah. I think that that's was a good story. really good. It's... I'm really happy you did it. Well, and the fact that like the real story hasn't even been around that long, like less than thirty years. The true true story's been out there. And I'm sure there's so many more details that I didn't have just because it hasn't, his contributions were ignored yeah. for so long. So I'm glad somebody like Frida was able to survive for as long as she did and share what kind of person Especially he was. Especially because, I mean, like, since she, like you said, that she lived so long, but then she also didn't just go in the shadows. So, like, she has more notoriety. Like, she has more fame. So, like, him yeah, being connected absolutely. to that, glomming it together makes him show up in history. Get yeah. the story out there. Yeah. Well, and also I would like to give credit where it's due. The Holocaust Memorial Museum is expanding every year to include these stories, you know, and they had such a big push to get these stories from people before they passed away. And that's where a lot of my really good information comes from. I was fortunate to find some great stuff there. And actually, I, you know, just speaking of that, um, I remember uh, the last couple of years when I was teaching night to my students, I was able to show them some videos that were so cool from these like holographic interviews that the Holocaust Memorial Museums did where they would have people come in, like Holocaust survivors come in. And remember, these are elderly people. And they would interview them for hours and hours and hours. And they'd have cameras on them from all different angles. So now, like, as those people pass on, students and other people can come to the museums and see this person up on a stage in a 3D hologram. And they can ask the hologram questions. And they were interviewed about so many different things that like, like, I remember one of the examples was a student asked, like, what's your favorite kind of food? And he starts talking about like the soup his wife makes, you know, like. That is so incredible. Just, but it's like one thing to hear the story by like reading a book or an article or hearing some dipshit podcasters talk about it. But like, it's entirely different to see the person telling their story and hearing it from their voice. Like the gentleman that I'm talking about from the video I saw, he was talking about his little sister and how, oh, he like sees her every day still like in his mind and she she passed away as like a really young child and because of the camps of course like when they were separated and he still sees her every day and when you just hear his voice break it's just like, oh my god it, it's real enough yeah. reading about it don't, don't get me wrong i'm not saying it doesn't feel real but like it's just so important i think especially in the like cultural climate that we're unfortunately in right now where this is used like as a political talking point where people are like, oh, talk about it's both not. sides. There's not a, both sides a lot of this. the time, there's not there's atrocities. two sides to our stories that we tell. Well, this is atrocities yeah. against humans. Like, there's not any kind of side where that was no. justifiable. You know? So I think it's so important to hear the stories from their words, too. So, like, I definitely encourage people to kind of get out there and, like, look this stuff up. Because I enjoy telling the stories and, like, being able to share that information. But I'm not saying that I'm, like, an expert. But also, so I mean, if you think about, so. like humans um historically like were an auditory kind of learning style you know like oh yeah that's how history was passed down through the oral tradition yeah so and like all about storytelling and everything since like cave times and all of that so there really is there really is something genuinely different about hearing someone's story from their voice oh 100 percent where, I mean, it's just, like, it hits so different. And I know part of it is the emotion of it. But even, like, you'll hear stories where, like, they're just telling it just, like, matter-of-factly. And just hearing it coming from them, though, is what's so incredible. It is. Yeah. Their own words, their own experiences, seeing their emotions. Yeah. I think it's important. And that's definitely somewhere I want to take my kids to see that when they're old enough that they can really appreciate it. Because by that time, of course... There's not going to be people left. Like when we were in yeah. school, I remember we got to hear, like we got to go to a, a synagogue and hear a story from a woman who survived. And of course, there were, we were middle schoolers and there were kids acting like assholes. But I was just mm -hmm. sitting there like trying not to cry. I was like, I can't believe this woman is here to tell us all of this. And like she just goes through and relives this story every week. You know, I'm so mad that I don't <sighs> remember it. I remember the trip yeah. down. I remember where we went afterwards for food. But I... And, like, I remember going in the synagogue, but I don't remember what she talked about or anything like that. And that makes me so sad. Yeah. But also, oh, like, yeah. I, only I was have, a like, seventh. Kind of flashes Yeah, of it. I was a seventh grader. Like. Twelve-year-old. Yeah, yeah. Like, 
I was very concerned about the boy I thought was cute was near me. Ugh. Right. Like, yeah. Right. Dumb shit. I, yeah, I can't. I can't um, single you out on that because I was definitely in that boat too. But um, puberty. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. No better, do better. Obviously, we were young. Yeah. But... Yeah. Um, my in-laws actually just went to the Holocaust Museum like yesterday. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. That's wild. Timing. Yeah. So um, I got sent like some synchronicities. I got sent um some pictures of the outside. She didn't take any inside, but she was saying that oh, like yeah, of course. Um, because it was my mother-in-law that sent it to me. Um, but she was saying that mm-hmm. it was absolutely astounding so i can't wait until they get back to hear all about it yeah yeah hear about what they took away from it Mm -hmm. yeah wow i don't there's not really like a clean way to end this one because it's just like let me tell you about some atrocities and about these like insanely brave people and then like herp to derp to remember that homosexuals can have cowards thank you i was like it's a c Mm -hmm. okay are not cowards we are not cowards Um, we love all of you, gay cousins, and we appreciate you mm-hmm. for living your truth in whatever way that that is yeah. safe and able for you to do that. Yes. Um, yes. And t- I'm glad you mentioned that because we do talk about how these people were like out and proud of themselves. Not everybody's in a position where it's safe for them to do that. Not that I'm saying freedom villain were safe to do that, but um, however you're living right now to survive and be okay, that's okay. Yeah. Like, and that's, and to all of our not gay but still cousins who are here and listening Mm -hmm. um you know we love our allies um and mother clap the ally we can't forget her uh we love we love our ally kings and queens and and in betweens so thank you all for being here and we love you so much and Britt, take it away where can they find us you can find us on Instagram at the Gay Cousin Club on thegaycousinclub.com. We are also now on TikTok at the Gay Cousin Club, which I think is actually why we probably have so many more recent downloads. Like our numbers have like gone way the fuck up like a lot in the past two weeks. So if you found us because of TikTok, um, sometimes we're serious. Sometimes we're just herp derping. So stick around and you'll get a little bit of everything. Thanks for being here. We're glad to have you. Yes. So on that note, um, we love you all. And since I opened it, I'm going to close it meeting adjourned bye love you bye love you